questions formulated um, of some of the stuff that makes sense. Okay. So first of all, what is the purpose, what is the role that autorhythmic cells play in the heart? Alright, so they trigger the set of current that's going to, that's going to um, stimulate the wave of depolarization, depolarization in muscle cells. Normally, in our skeletal muscle, in our smooth muscle, that happens how? Next. Nerves. The nerve impulses. Okay. So our normal component is we have we have a synaptic bulb releasing neurotransmitters, and those neurotransmitters we bind to a receptor, and um, if we're looking at the autonomic nervous system, we would have a preganglionic and postganglionic neuron. Right. Since this is muscle, let's look at smooth muscle since we're talking about autonomic. And so it would be either norepinephrine or acetylcholine binding to smooth muscle which would trigger um, changes in the cell membrane. If it's acetylcholine, it's a muscarinic receptor, it's typically a G-protein pathway, right? Remember the metabotropic pathway? Um, if it's alpha or beta, a similar component um, is triggered. And so we are, but we have a, a, a neurotransmitter binding to a receptor changing cytoplasmic channels, either directly or indirectly. If it was skeletal muscle, the neurotransmitter is still acetylcholine. All right. And this time, however, it is a nicotinic receptor. You guys remember what nicotinic receptors did? Ionotrophs. Ionotrophs, meaning they opened an ion channel. And so, this receptor itself would be an ion channel and would allow sodium ions into the cell. Is that, would that be a graded potential or an action potential? Great. A graded potential because we can make it, that depolarization weaker or stronger by the number of acetylcholine molecules that actually bound to the receptor. So when we look at the action, the, Resting membrane potential change in skeletal muscle, we have this greater potential occurring at the neuromuscular junction. If insufficient amount of acetylcholine binds to the receptor, this greater potential doesn't reach threshold. If sufficient acetylcholine binds to the receptors, then enough sodium ions will enter the cell. This is an excitatory impulse, and we would reach threshold of the voltage-gated channels on either side of our, neuro of our um, neuromuscular junction. So what, we drew, what I drew right here would be this along here. So these would all be the graded potential ligand-gated channels and a sufficient sodium ion enter the cell, it would open voltage-gated channels on either side. So each skeletal muscle cell had its own axon terminal. Not its own nerve, that would be too fine a control, but at least its own axon terminal. That would be effective in <coughs> allowing the sodium to enter the cell. So instead, with cardiac muscle, what we have are leak channels and the Plenty current channels. Okay. We do have receptors for acetylcholine, for norepinephrine, but those are for modifying the effect of these components. So, for two reasons, we never have a resting membrane potential in cardiac muscle. One, leak channels don't close. Right. So, if we have a predominant of uh, open sodium channels in reference to potassium, we're going to always have sodium leaking into the cell. Characteristics of the eye funny channel. What do you think from what you remember yesterday? 
what characteristics of it. There were two things that that uh, operated eye funny channels or controlled eye funny channels. And what is it that's going to, about that, that's going to keep the um, autorhythmic cells from having a resting membrane potential? Pardon? Well, that's the leak channel. What was it that opened them? We had two factors that, that determined when an eye funny channel opened. They're voltage. Uh, voltage gated. So as we see repolarization occurring, from the previous action potential of the autorhythmic cell, it's reaching this hyperpolarization that actually opens the eye funny channels. And that's the key thing here, the opening of the funny channels that prevents arrested membrane potential. So in skeletal muscle, we would come down, we would hyperpolarize, and then our sodium potassium pumps would return the resting membrane potential mm -hmm. until the next trigger of opening our, our um, ligand gated sodium channels. These channels are opened by reaching hyperpolarization. So the cell never has the opportunity to stabilize a resting membrane potential. Okay, that's the key factor in the fact that our channel pattern, our, our current pattern, electrical flow pattern of autorhythmic cells looks like this. Because as soon as we get to this point, those channels open and we start this again. We get to hyperpolarization, that opens the iPhone channel, and we immediately have sodium entering the cell. Now you were asking about specifically what those channels were like. Remember I said that they were dual flow. So both sodium ions and potassium ions are going to pass through. Sodium into the cell, potassium out of the cell. So because we're seeing depolarization, however, the primary ion one that's going to move in the highest numbers is going to result in a positive change of depolarization. So sodium is going to move into the cell at the faster rate than potassium is moving through the same channel out of the cell. Okay. So would these be a symport or an antiport? Antiport. Because they're going in opposite directions. Now, does it require ATP? No, no, because they're both going down the gradient. All right, did you have another question, Noel? So, are they voltage gated channels or are they just ligand gated? They are voltage gated channels. Oh, they are voltage gated channels. Yes, which is an interesting exception to our rule that voltage gated channels are always, remember we said this last semester, voltage gated channels are always action potential. Yeah. So, these are affected by a drop in the, in, in the um, current, it's a negative downward flow, and but they create a, a um, rated potential. And we can change the number of these channels that are open with cyclic AMP and the timing of when they open. Okay. And that's what that's what cyclic AMP does. So having covered the beginning of this, so yes, we do have a let's kind of go through that again. So we'll start with our repolarization. So at this point, okay. We have our voltage-gated potassium channels are closing. They're open here, and that's why we're doing repolarization. Mm -hmm. But they start to close. Okay. Um, as they reach this, well, this would be one. As they reach hyperpolarization, now our eye funny channels open. 
designated again by the negative charge and the number of cyclic AMP. So cyclic AMP is going to determine, it's going to affect how many channels open and it's specifically when, at what negative hyperpolarization. So they'll open earlier and more of them will open. Okay. And then we have um, leak channels that are also going to allow for sodium ions are more than the leak channel for potassium. But again, it's number two here that is the most important and the easiest to control, and the one that's affected um, by the norepinephrine system. Then we do depolarization, and we enhance this with the opening of transient voltage gated again calcium channels. Okay. Now. I don't know if you're going to approach this, Amy, with your group. Um, I'm going to talk about calcium's role on Tuesday, um, and then additional ions when we talk about EKG um, effects. But, but calcium binds to potassium channels and can affect um, whether or not they're open. But we add this to transit, meaning short. They're open for just a brief period of time. And then we finally reach the threshold potential of fast, long-lasting, um, in other words, not just a brief period, this is not a very long time, but it's longer lasting than the transient, but primarily these are identified as fast, voltage-gated calcium channels. Remember, this is different from our skeletal muscle. Because in our skeletal muscle, those are sodium channels. Are they fast acting? Do we have that fast acting or slow acting in skeletal as far as that? No. This is this is determined. This is the reason we highlight that these are fast is because in the contractile cell we have the slow for the plateau, and that's why we differentiate the fast here. All right, that brings us to a maximum. At the same time, our potassium voltage-gated channels open, and now we see our rapid repolarization starting to see all over again. Okay. But as far as the clue or the, the key significance of why we don't need neurons to trigger the cardiac contractile cell to, con is to contract, is this is the source, this right here, is the source of the stimulus of contractile cardiac cells. Any question? Yeah, so what you just said the slow depolarization is what triggers the transient? Voltage gauge calcium to open? Once it gets, these are voltage gated, so once they get to this point, okay. it's just an additional, and on Tuesday we'll talk about their role with potassium okay. and stuff. It was on the slides from yesterday, but I didn't want to go into that quite yet. Okay. It's a little confusing on potassium, so with the uh, case study we have on murder by poisoning, the thought was potassium was added to hyperkalemia, and there's a bit of a um, Overlap, I want to take a little bit more time with that. Potassium can shorten repolarization, but it can also make the cells hyper-excitable, and it eventually makes them stop. So there's a lot of things that seem contradictory, but I want to take a little bit more time after we've had some opportunity to you guys review this process a little bit better on Tuesday. So this action potential right here is reflected by the current entering our contractile cells. So remember we have our conductive, our autorhythmic cells, and they are going to be attached via intercalated discs. <coughs> We're going to ignore the conductive cells right now and just look at the contractile cells or the atria. 
calcium. So that's what our positive ions flowing into the cell. Okay? So this first flow into the first contracted cell is going to be a flood of positive ions, but in this case it's calcium ions. Now let's look at what happens in the contractile cell. So until this happens, the contractile cell, remember, has a resting membrane potential. So it has a resting membrane potential for all the reasons that we covered in the in Bio 430, negative proteins, more leaky potassium channels than leaky sodium channels on the sodium potassium pump. So resting membrane potential, and then all of a sudden, there is that flood of calcium ions in that first contractile cell, right, which causes it to reach its threshold potential instantly well, in relative terms, and we see a spike of depolarization. What is this channel that's opened? Or channels? Sodium. What type of sodium channel? Ligand gated or voltage gated? Voltage gated. So these are voltage gated sodium channels. So then, what flows through the gap junction from this contractile cell to this contractile cell? Sodium. Sodium. All right. And so then we see the typical, that's what's going to happen for the rest of the contractile cells of either the atria or the ventricles. Because that first spike of positive ions is going to flood through it. Like the other muscle cells, it's not just one voltage-gated channel at the beginning of the cell. It flows along the membrane, and we have that domino effect of this action potential opening the next set of voltage-gated channels, and that opens the next set, and so on. So that current is flowing along the plasma membrane to the next cell, right? as well as affecting the contractile mechanisms of actin and myosin binding and so on within the cell, but we're just kind of following the current flow. So we have a depolarization due to voltage-gated channels, and that this whole thing, remember, is our action potential. So now we start repolarization, the sodium channels close, and two channels are affected by that current. Voltage-gated calcium, calcium channels, and these are slow. They open first. Right, um, and then we have voltage-gated potassium channels. Now, if all we had were voltage-gated potassium channels, we would expect to see that kind of a response as potassium is leaving, going down its concentration gradient, and leaving the contractile cell. However, because calcium is coming in, we stay positive. We're getting slowly more negative, but we stay positive. And then finally, at this point, voltage-gated calcium channels close. And then finally, we see that rapid repolarization because voltage-gated potassium channels are still open. Are all these voltage-gated channels slow? Like considered Only slow for the calcium. Just the calcium. The sodium and the potassium ones here are the same type um, as what we saw. The potassium is slower than the sodium mm -hmm. because it doesn't open until we get to this point. Mm -hmm. Okay, but we don't really refer to them as slow or fast. In that sense. So we get back to our resting membrane potential, right? Until the next stimulus occurs due to the depolarization of the autorhythmic cells. So if we look at this as a pattern, you guys can see over here, 
Um, here, let me do it in a different color. So here's our pattern for our auto business house. with our contractile cells is a flat resting membrane potential until the action potential is reached. That's our stimulus. And we see this occur. Actually, it's going to be a little bit shorter than that unless you have a really fast heart rate. And direct response. So when we're looking at skeletal muscle cell, and you know, we drew the little arrows <coughs> for the stimulus, that's going to be due to the depolarization of our autorhythmic cells. So that's as much as I want to talk about it now until we've gone through uh, EKG and some cardiac cycle stuff today. And then on Tuesday, especially when we talk about control of blood pressure in a couple weeks, we're going to have. Um, a week from Tuesday, two weeks from yesterday, we'll come back and look at the effects of other ions and drugs and norepinephrine and acetylcholine and get. Okay? By that time, you'll have a little bit more opportunity to feel comfortable with this before we start changing parameters. So what I want to look at now is how all of this is reflected when we look at an ECG. measuring an electrode. So the diagrams I drew on the board for action potentials are measured directly by placing an electrode within the cell and then outside the cell in the surrounding fluid. All right? ECGs are a comparison. We don't stick electrodes in your heart muscle um, or in the skin. It's a comparison between the difference in potential between what's in the heart and the skin. Um, and so it can be affected, there's impedance to the fluorescent lights, metal that you're wearing, and so on, um, can affect that. We'll talk about it a little bit in the lab on Tuesday, uh, Eindhoven's triangle, uh, there's a ground, and there's, well, there's a lot of physics involved. But we're not measuring a current directly, we're looking at changes in the direction of the current flow, all right, um, but we're not measuring that current directly. E, the, the ECG is... Soundwise can be confused with an EEG, which is the electroencephalogram, measuring electrical current in the brain for sleep or epilepsy or a variety of reasons. And so EKG is used just soundwise because of the hard C when you say cardio to just help people's brains pick it up a little bit easier. Okay? Kind of like when we did muscle and I, and I would say a D duct and a B duct, you know, instead of adduct and abduct, it's a little hard to pick that up. So, 
Um, when we start out with electrocardiogram, what we're picking up are the, again, the differences in electrical current flow between the heart and the skin. Typically, in the hospital, if you're having an EKG, they'll use 12 electrodes. I remember one time working in the nursery trying to help some uh, techs try to do electrocardiogram on a preemie with 12 electrodes on this tiny little baby. <laughs> and it was like, it was ridiculous trying to find a place to put them all. But if you have a quick uh, one in the doctor's office, what we'll be doing um, in lab, we just use three plus the ground. All right, so it's usually right, left, left arm, right arm, left ankle, and right ankle, with one of them being a ground. Um, and again, we'll talk about the physics a little bit more on Tuesday. So what we see is, again, a change in the pattern. Depending on which electrode you read, the waves can be deflected in the opposite, and they can look very different one to another. So the typical electrode pattern that you're seeing um, can look very different if you read a different one of the 12 electrodes. But remember the pattern of the origin of our electrical impulses. So these are the placement of the autorhythmic cells. And we have the, what, the group of cells that depolarize the fastest, unless we have diseased tissue, are located up here in the sinoatrial node. So again, we don't use abbreviations on live quizzes or exams, so I want you to know what SA stands for. And that's sinoatrial. And this depolarizes at the rate typically of about 100 times a minute. That's not normal average heart rate. And that reflects the role of acetylcholine from the vagus nerve. So if you were to disconnect that, someone who has a heart transplant, we have on average a higher dressing heart rate because it doesn't have that acetylcholine connect. Is there any endocrine organ that would supply acetylcholine in place of the vagus nerve? Adrenoplasm. Adrenoplasm is going to do epinephrine replacement of norepinephrine for sympathetic, because it takes longer to provide it, because it has to get there in the blood and it takes longer to remove it because of its half-life in the blood. But there is no similar endocrine organ that releases acetylcholine. So there is no resting ability to lower the heart rate. Once norepinephrine or epinephrine has been released, you have to wait for half time for that to be clear can take a lot longer for that rapid heart rate to be uh, lowered. So SA node typically fires these autoimmune cells about 100 times a minute. I went over this yesterday. The atrioventricular node, which is at the base of the atrial septum, inner atrial septum, just near the uh, atrioventricular valve. And then there is a connecting band of fibers called the atrioventricular bundle that connects the atrioventricular node to the interventricular septum. The old term for this is bundle of his, HIS. Uh, the newer term without using somebody's name is just atrioventricular bundle. Um, atrioventricular node fires around 40 to 60 times a minute if it's on its own. So if the SA node isn't working, then the fire would be about 40 to 60 times a minute. The bundle branches. So it's this bundle of pits here, that's not these branches, that's up here. These two branches coming down are called bundle branches, and they'll fire about 40 times a minute if the atrioventricular node is not working properly. And then passing up into the ventricular walls, we have Purkinje fire fibers or conduction myofibers. And they're between 30 and 40, the actual ventricular muscle cells are around 15. So based on the typical ECG or EKG, this is the standard pattern of changes. Now, this is not reflecting depolarization and repolarization. Right? Remember, we don't have an electrode actually in the cell. So I'll diagram this on the board for you in just a moment. But when the heart is at rest, and we do not have the ventricular contractile cells undergoing depolarization, we see a straight line. What is actually happening, happening to the heart? So let me just draw this standard ECG pattern up on the board. 
straight line. Then we have this reflection here like this. All right, so this is called the P wave. Q, R, S wave, and T wave. Then we have the rest period and we have another T wave. So this is called the PQ or PR interval. And this is called the TP interval. Not toilet paper, but. So during this rest period, if we're not looking at a resting membrane potential, the reason this line is flat is because there is no current flowing through our ventricular contractile cells, right, or through the atrial contractile cells. The P wave is created by the depolarization through the atrial contractile cells. We're not seeing current through the autorhythmic cells, but the P wave is depolarization. of atrial contractor cells. And the movement of the current is in relationship to where the electrodes, as the current moves to closer to or away from the electrodes. All right, it's not showing depolarization and repolarization. It's one of the hardest things for students to convert their thinking to. We're going up, but we're going down, so it must be positive ions going in and positive ions going out. That's not the case. It's the overall movement of the current between the electrodes that are being picked up in the skin. But that's caused by depolarization of the atrial contractile cells. It's not caused by the contraction of the atria. That will be a result of this. But what we're actually seeing is the current flowing through those cells, which will, in the end, result in them contracting because of the movement of the troponin and tropomyosin and so on. Okay. Then we have a lag period or latent period. We don't see any change. And the reason for this is because as the current flows through the atrial contractile cells to reach the AV node, at, the a, at this site, remember I talked about a, a heart skeleton, a cardiac skeleton? And that's connective tissue between the atria and the ventricles and into the valve that's non-conductive. And the purpose for that, do you guys remember what the purpose for that was? So it has to go around? We want to redirect the wave of depolarization from the apex towards the base so that we have a movement of blood out the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. Right. So it's going to go from AV node to the atrial ventricular bundle down the bundle branches and out the conducting myofibers, and that's what's happening in the PQ interval. We're not seeing any depolarization of contractile cells, so we see a flat line. So PQ <coughs> and is the conduction of depolarization. from the AV node to the conduction myofibers, which are the same thing as Purkinje fibers. So if that takes a long time, if there's been damage to the AV node or to the interventricular septum, then that can be prolonged. And we can have such a long interval that the SA node fires again. And we never get the ventricles firing that first time. Mm -hmm. Then we have the QRS wave, and that is the ventricle contractile cells depolarizing. So depolarization. Mm -hmm. 
of both right and left. Contractile cells. Which is going to result in their contraction, but this is not a measurement of force. All right? We're just seeing the current moving through. The T wave is, is caused by the repolarization of ventricular contractile cells. So repolarization. So if the ventricular contractile cells repolarize, where's our atrial contractile cell repolarization on the EKG? QRS. It's blocked. Yeah, it's covered up by the stronger current occurring with the QRS. Even with the prolonged PR wave, we never really see the atrial repolarization. So this is what's happening then as a result of the autorhythmic cells. What would be, if we were to look at our autorhythmic cell pattern that I drew over here, and we were to lay our um, ECG over this, As a result of autorhythmic cell depolarization, we are going to see the P wave. Because that's what triggers every time there's an autorhythmic cell depolarization, as say those two fires, we get a P wave. Okay. So this is going to result in that. Then, I'll probably have this drawn a little bit too large. go along, we get another autorhythmic cell depolarization, and we get another P wave. So the more frequent our SA node fires, say we have norepinephrine, the cardiac um, sympathetic fibers fire, we're going to have a more frequent P wave because it's the autorhythmic current that triggers the depolarization of our atrial cells. So there should be a P wave for every autorhythmic depolarization. So now, using the red pen, we have, just prior to the P wave, we have our autorhythmic cell depolarizing, what's going to be happening here? So our next P wave. The entire, remember the funny current channel and all of that, that's what's going on during this entire time that we have, we go through the ECG. So all during the QRS and the repolarization and the resting period until the P wave, we have this slow increase, or rapid, but we have the addition of positive ions inside the autoimmune cell until we reach threshold again. So it kind of draws it out, it's happening well, it's quite fast, but that's what's going to determine when the next P wave is. Um, if you're you know, watching somebody monitors in the hospital room or whatever, you're seeing that little oscilloscope whistling. That's what's happening as far as the current is being read on the oscilloscope. And again, different people, so when we do ECGs, um, EKGs, different people will have different heights of the P wave um, depending on their body mass. So someone who's um, really, really tall and skinny versus someone who's short and chubby, you're going to see a different ECG. Okay? 
because of the impedance that effect on flow. So there are some problems then that occur, obviously, um, with the ECG dependent on these are real basic problems um, that can be read. So in a normal rhythm, called a normal sinus rhythm, all right, you would have a This will be variable again depending on what lead you look at. We do have the P wave here, the QRS, the T wave. Then you would have the TP interval and we start all over again. If there is a rapid heart rate, okay, and it's due uh, to, usually it's called tachycardia if it's over 100, and bradycardia if it's less than 60. Now, again, someone who's athletic and has a well-exercised heart that's strong and doesn't need to pump as often. You know, so my husband and my son's heart rates are both below 50. Technically, clinically, that's bradycardia, but it has its reasons. It's not due to uh, problems with the uh, heart autorhythmic control. Now, my father-in-law would get a low heart rate, all right, below 40. Um, and the alarms would go off, and so he had to take drugs, medications, to keep his heart rate up because his blood pressure would get too low. It wasn't because his heart was strong enough, it didn't have to need that often. So he finally ended up having a pacemaker implanted that would fire only when his heart rate dropped below a certain rate, not firing all the time. So tachycardia is a heart rate over 100, Dave bradycardia is a heart rate usually less than 60. And atrophy relation. Here you'll notice the QRS wave is deflected downward. That's just reading a different, when I went online to find examples, it's just reading from a different lead. But you'll notice that we have a QRS, so the ventricles are going to end up pumping in response to this depolarization. However, the atria are not showing a P wave. There's an atrial, sometimes a previous to atrial fibrillation, you'll have atrial flutter. So individual Cardiac contractile cells within the atria are depolarizing on their own. And so you just have the atrial muscles kind of doing this without a concentrated contraction, moving blood at the very end uh, before the, the ventricles fire. And as I said before, this is compatible with life because most of the blood entering into the atria does so by a pressure gradient. It just flows in because pressure in the atria is lower than pressure in the vena cava. However, if we look at ventricular fibrillation, now we have individual groups of ventricular muscles depolarizing 15 times a minute at different times. So there is no coordinated wave. And you'll see fibrillation where the heart just quivers and now there's no pumping. There's no movement of the blood and that's not compatible with life. Yes. So the difference between the, the sinus tachycardia and the atrial fibrillation, they're both going downwards, is the way you would tell the difference is because the atrial isn't a flat, like... Yeah, here you can, you can still see, and this was a little fuzzy here, you can still see a P wave and a T wave mm -hmm. pattern, whereas in the fibrillation, it's just, there's no consistent depolarization of the P wave. <laughs> One of the more interesting and uh, finds is the nodal block. So we're here referring to. Yeah. So for the brief, cardiac would just be like a long one to P. Yeah. Because typically the P to T stays the same. Nodal, the AB nodal block is, you know, I talked about the time it takes here for the P wave to the QRS. So this is the electrical current traveling from AV node to AV bundle to bundle branches to the ventricular conduction fibers. And um, you don't have to be able to differentiate between the different degrees, but here we have a P wave, QRS, T, and then we have another P wave right here, and then a really long, and here we have a P wave and a long time, P wave and a short time, mm -hmm. all right, with a complete heart block. Um, you can go a P wave 
And then we have no QRS with that particular P wave, and then we get another P wave in a QRS. So we skip the QRS. Now, what's happening when the heart is at rest? What's happening to blood flow during this interval between the heart's contraction and the next P wave? When the heart is at relax, what's happening to blood flow? It's flowing through the atria, through open atrioventricular valves into the ventricles, and as we'll talk about on Tuesday, it's stretching them. And one of the roles, one of the factors in this stretching is that the more the, like a rubber band is done, still working properly, you stretch it out, it recoils stronger, so it still comes back to its original shape. Heart muscle does the same thing. You stretch it out, within reason, so the actin mice that are still overlapping, the more it stretches out, the stronger the force with which it contracts. So it pumps more blood out if more blood comes in. If we have no rest period, we have no filling period, then very little blood is going to be pumped out. So there's a direct relationship between the amount of rest period and the blood that able to fill in the ventricles. So this is often due to disease tissue, the damaged AV node uh, from some type of myocardial infarct. We can induce it in the laboratory by just tying a thread between the atria and the ventricle and interfering with the conduction. But it's usually due to some type of damaged tissue. All right. Let's drop down here to the myocardial infarct. There's a lot of different signs, um, but the easiest one for you to recognize, since this is not a whole ECG class, is an elevated ST segment. So we have a P wave, a QRS, and this is the T wave. The S segment is usually below the line. So the S segment is elevated and the T wave itself is elevated. And so that's a common sign of damaged dead heart muscle tissue. This is a change in the impedance to the flow of current as the ventricles are depolarizing. Also, it can take a, if there's an extensive amount of damage, the QRS segment can be widened because it takes longer at the time. So from here to here is the measurement of time, all right? From here to here is the measurement of amplitude of the current. So if it takes, if we have diseased tissue, it takes longer for that current to find its way around it you can have a widened ST segment as well as an elevated. And that brings us to the mitral stenosis, which is hard to see here since it's upside down. Remember what valve is the mitral valve? The bypass bit, right? So if there is damage to the valve and it doesn't close properly, when the ventricles contract, blood is going to return to the atria instead of going out the aorta. As that happens, it enlarges the atria. As that enlarges the atrium, it takes longer for the atrial contractile cells to depolarize. And so that's seen by an enlarged P wave. The, again, it's hard to see on that diagram, but you would see something that takes longer for that current to flow through because of the increased size due to the increased pressure on that system. All right, we're going to do um, ECGs next week, so we'll, during lab time, we'll come back and look at these again a little bit more, once you have your own to look at. But before lab, the class is over, I want to get into the cardiac cycle. There are a couple of new terms, but no new concepts, all right, to the cardiac cycle. And I put um, a video up on uh, D2L that I want to show you in a moment um, that kind of goes through each of these steps. And like a ring, it's hard to say where we start and stop because it's a continuous flow. But typically, we start with the heart at rest and take it through the atrioventricular contractions and get back to the heart at rest again. So when we're looking at pattern of, of valve closing and opening, Guys, remember what I said instigates a valve to open or a valve to close? Pressure. Pressure. Excuse me. Pressure changes. So keep that in mind. 
If you keep that in mind, you're not going to have to memorize these steps. Okay? You can figure out what's happening. So we start out with the heart at rest. Where is pressure going to be the highest of blood flow? If the atria are not pumping and the ventricles are not contracting. Is the pressure going to be highest in the atria or in the ventricles? In the atria. All right? So with pressure being higher in the atria, blood is going to push the atrioventricular valves open, and we will have AV valves that are open as the blood flows into the ventricles. The ventricles are relaxed and they're not pumping. Which side of the semilunar valves is going to be, is pressure going to be the greatest? On the, they're relaxed. So the pressure is greatest on the great vessel side. So blood is going to be flowing against the cusps of the semilunar valves, and they will be closed. All right. So when the heart is at rest during our TP interval, so during the TP interval when the heart is at rest, this is known as ventricular filling. So the AV valves are open, and the semilunar valves are closed. Remember these function as pairs. So you'll have one AV valve open, the other one closed. The AV valves are going to do the same thing at the same time together, and the same with the semilunar valves. All right? Then we have our P wave. What does that cause? Depolarization. Depolarization of the atrial muscles, and so they are contractile cells, and so they will contract, and we'll see a slight rise of pressure in the atria as a little bit more blood enters the ventricles, and then we have the um, PQ interval, and we start the QRS depolarization of the ventricles, and then they contract. So as the ventricles are contracting, as we begin QRS wave, pressure starts to rise in the ventricles. So pressure due to the QRS, pressure rises in the ventricles, and so the first thing that happens as a result of that rising pressure is closure of the atrioventricular valves. So the AV valves will close. Now, we have two sets of valves closed. We have a closed system. Does that make sense? So my lunar valves are already closed. Now our atrioventricular valves are closed. And so this closed system is known as isovolumetric. No blood is leaving because the semilunar valves are closed. No blood is coming in because the AV valves are closed. So we have isovolumetric. The ventricles are contracting, so it's known as isovolumetric contraction. Pressure rises very sharply because it's a closed system, and the ventricles are still contracting, and blood's not going anywhere. So that then induces the opening of the semilunar valve. As soon as that occurs, we have ventricular ejection. Blood is going to leave into the pulmonary trunk and into the aorta as long as the ventricles pressure become, it remains greater than those vessels. Then the ventricles relax because they're repolarizing. So as the ventricle uh, ECG system reaches the T wave, the ventricles relax. Pressure drops. And what's going to change first, the semilunar valves or the atrioventricular valves? 
the semilunar valve. So now pressure is going to become lower in the ventricles than in the aorta. And so that backflow of blood in the aorta towards the left ventricle, and same for the pulmonary trunk towards the right ventricle, is going to fill those cusps up with blood, and the semilunar valves will close. Now we have both sets of valves closed again, because the atrial ventricular valves haven't opened. So we're back to an isovolumetric system. We're back to isovolumetric, but the ventricles are continuing to relax, pressure is continuing to drop, so we have isovolumetric relaxation. With both valves closed, AV valves are still closed. Eventually, once we're past the T wave, we get to the TP, beginning of the TP interval again. Pressure in the ventricles is now lower than pressure in the atria. AV valves open. And we're back to ventricular filling. Let me show you the link online. Um, this is the one that I, it's not this heart, but it's the one that I um, put up on the screen. So with this illustration, you can see that the two atria contract together, and then the two ventricles contract, and then they're both relaxed. So the pattern that we look at in the cardiac cycle, the heart is at rest. This, my left hand would be the two atria, my right hand the two ventricles. Heart's at rest, ventricular filling, as AV valves are open, and semilunar valves are closed, pressure lowest in the ventricles. Then the atria receive depolarization signal, P wave, they contract, that current travels through the AV nodal system and the conduction myofibers. As the atria are relaxing, the ventricles contract, both of them together. That closes the AV valves and opens the semilunar valves, and we have ventricular ejection, and then the ventricles relax. Semilunar valves close, atrial ventricular ventricular valves open, and we repeat the process. And that's essentially what the cardiac cycle is. So... With this video here, well, it's not a video, but you can take it through a series. Now, before we look at those, and we're going to come back to this again on Tuesday, this diagram is in your lecture notes, and it looks terrifying, all right, if you don't like reading diagrams. But it essentially tells you everything that you need to know. You will have this diagram on your lecture exam. It will not be labeled, all right? But let's go through it briefly before I kind of show you in, uh, a little bit about what's going on. This will show you what valves are open and what, what valves are closed. <coughs> and over here, the numbers along the side here have to do with pressure. All right? Pressure in either the ventricles or the atria or the aorta. We don't look at pressure in the pulmonary trunk. It would be lower. Now, typically, do you guys know the terms diastole and systole when we talk about blood pressure? Systolic pressure over diastolic pressure, the higher number is the pressure in the blood vessels when blood is being pushed through it. Diastolic pressure is the lower number when we're in between, when we're at heart rest. So the average range is a little high now, but it used to be 120 over 80 was average. That's now considered to be borderline hypertensive. Um, the upper end of, of normal. But that's still kind of the numbers that they put up here on the screen. So here is this um, green line right here is showing pressure in the aorta. The red line is showing pressure in the ventricles. And the um, yellow line right here is showing pressure in the 
atria. So when the heart is at rest, and down here is an ECG, I think it's the top of the diagram in, in your lecture notes. So when the heart is at rest, notice that pressure in the TP interval, there's our T on, and we're seeing pressure starts to drop in the ventricles. As it drops in the ventricles, the semilunar valves close, and you see a little bump in the pressure, there's a kind of a little bit of a turbulence in the aorta when the semilunar valves close, and then pressure continues to drop, continuing over here, as we're in the TP interval. Everybody with me on that? Then we have the P wave, all right? So we have, as a result of the P wave, we have atrial contraction. So here you can see the pressure in the atria rises slightly. Notice that, if you look on your diagram, it might be a little clearer than here. Here's the atrial pressure. The red is the ventricular pressure. Notice that atrial pressure is higher than ventricular pressure. You can see that on the diagram. Therefore, blood is flowing through the atria, through the atrial ventricular valve, into the ventricle. It has to be. The pressure is higher than the atria than it is in the ventricles. Then we have our QRS wave. That triggers depolarization. That's the result of depolarization in the ventricles. They contract. When they contract, pressure rises in the ventricles. That pressure now becomes higher than atrial pressure. So at this point right here, the atrial ventricular valve closes. And you can see that marked on your diagram. The semilunar valves are closed because aortic pressure is higher than ventricular pressure. So that backflow keeps the semilunar valves closed. So now we enter isometric contraction. And you can see how rapidly ventricular pressure spikes until ventricular pressure becomes greater than aortic pressure. And so at this point, the semilunar valves are open. Ventricular pressure continues to be greater than aortic pressure, and so we have ejection, ventricular ejection. If you look back down to our ECG, we now have ventricular repolarization. As a result of that, our muscles relax. You can see ventricular pressure dropping, the red line, and finally it becomes less than aortic pressure. So what's going to happen here? The myunder valves are going to close. AV valves are still closed. We rapidly drop pressure until the ventricular pressure becomes less than atrial pressure. And now the atrial ventricular valve open. Notice what's happening to atrial pressure here? Slowly. It's rising. Slowly, but rising. Why? Blood is continuing to flow back into the heart. And it can't go anywhere because the valves are closed. And so pressure rises slowly. So let me just briefly, I'm not going to illustrate what happens here. Come on. Ejection. You can see that the green line, our atrial ventricular valves are closed, our semilunar valves are open, and we have ejection of blood. Okay. So when we come back on, take a play around with this over the weekend, and when we come back on Tuesday, I'm going to take you, there's some exercises in lab that are not to be turned in, just kind of help you understand this uh, material, um, go through, and so if we have, you should be able to, after Tuesday, after we go through this, you should be able to tell me if I say atrial pressure is greater than ventricular pressure, um, which is greater than 
Well, aortic pressure, which is greater than ventricular pressure, which is greater than atrial pressure, what valves would be open and closed? Okay. You'll get questions like that on the exam. Don't be afraid because you can, you're going to have this diagram. It won't be labeled. So what did I just say? Aortic pressure is greater than atrial pressure, which is greater than ventricular pressure. So where do we have that happening? Aortic pressure is greater than atrial pressure, which is greater than ventricular pressure. So semi-lunar valves are going to be closed, all right? Atrial ventricular valves are going to be open. And you can come back to this graph and see that when you look at the graph. Okay, you can also figure it out just using the logic. So we'll play with this on Tuesday. I, I put it up online so you can uh, play around with it and it won't seem quite so fierce, uh, strange um, on Tuesday. But we're going to pull this together. Um, and again, there's no new information in this. We're just putting together the different facts that you've already learned about the valves versus the chambers in the ECG. Yeah.